So thank you all for coming. And the title of this talk today is Repositioning of the Advanced Therapies in the Post-COVID Era. And before I go any further, um, there's a bio of myself, which contains probably more than you ever wanted to know about Jane Andrews. Um, it'll suffice to say that I am a scientist and businesswoman that's done a walkabout both for the past many years. Um, I've worked in many areas of life science and regenerative medicine. I got my undergrad master's and PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I was a graduate student for really a long time. After which I did a postdoc at Penn State University in membrane biochemistry and biophysics looking at what I would call the primordial stem cells, that of the pre-implantation embryo, sperm eggs and embryos in vitro and their development developing culture conditions, cryoprotectants, uh, cryotherapy, all of the things that has now come around into regenerative medicine now, which is one of the reasons regenerative medicine has been so dear to my heart. So what is the definition we're gonna to use today? We're gonna to use advanced therapies. When this field began, it was more regenerative medicine. Everybody used regenerative medicine. And then I believe it was Chris Mason who coined cell gene. And so we were using cell gene in the United States a lot more than in Europe, and Europe coined advanced therapies. I believe they're all pretty much covering the same thing, and so today we'll define it as advanced therapies, which includes tissue and cell therapy, gene therapy, immunotherapy, and cellular components such as exosomes. So as we go on from there, I'd like to sort of just reiterate what a convergence of technology this industry is, which is one of the things that makes it so exciting and yet so challenging. Because we not only use, oops. We not only use uh, cell therapy, we use things like engineering, in many chemical engineering, electrical engineering, bioengineering, cell physiology, biomanufacturing, information technology, gene transfer, let alone all of the science around the indications that we're trying to cure with the technologies of advanced therapies. So it's a, it's a really convergence of technologies that we have to harness to make these cures out of living cells and their components. But when we look at it as a whole, when we look at it as part of biologics and life science, we can see that it's really very small. And in 2022, there were only 22 approved advanced therapies compared to all of biologics, which was 318, which is really very small when you think about all of life science as a whole. But I think the most important points are in the bullets, where you see that advanced therapies are actually 7% of all commercial biologics. And by uh, when I last looked, April 17th, we had 30 approved FDA uh, advanced therapies. That's probably gone up since then. So the field is advancing very fast, but it is very young. And why is it so important? Well, the whole world is having an aging population. We have more older people in the demographics in the world now than we did uh, 10, 15 years ago. For example, um, in 2030, there will be more people over 60 than under age 10. And in the US, by 2030, 19% of the population will be over 65. Japan has a very aging population. In fact, young people are not having children because they have to take care of their grandparents or their parents, either one. Um, and socialized medicine has to take care of all of these older people that are getting sick. So this is where it fits into health span and longevity because we need to keep older people healthier longer. Uh, there are, it's not only because we want to stay younger and healthier, it's because there's a real burden on society and governments to pay for the health care that is needed to keep everyone going. So how did COVID affect the industry? In the short term, with allogeneic products, cell donors didn't want to go out to donate blood or tissues. And that was basically because of the social distancing and the fear of catching COVID. 
when you look at autologous, um, apheresis centers were just shutting down because they didn't want their people to get exposed. So there was a shortage of uh, source materials, so to speak. Um, the ability to travel was limited. In fact, there was a ban on travel from Europe to the US. And many of these products are produced in one place and have to be transported very quickly because they're in the live status to the patient. So there was a great reduction in uh, autologous therapies and clinical trials that were being run during COVID. In manufacturing, there was a uh, vector manufacturing was limited because those raw materials were being used uh, to create the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, in fact, one third of cell therapy companies reported delays or discontinuation of manufacturing activities. So if we look now more at clinical trials, if we look at the biologics as a whole, rather than just regenerative medicine cell therapy, we can see there was a 44% reduction in phase one trials, 26% reduction in phase two, and a 22% reduction in phase three. There was limited availability of FDA staff to uh, review BLAs in this area because all efforts were being put onto COVID-19. Peter Marks had indicated to everyone that there would be a slowdown in the process of commercialization. Uh, clinical trial enrollment suffered because people weren't going into hospitals, people weren't to, to get their, uh, their blood drawn or to receive treatment uh, because again, there was uh, sanctions on who could enter hospitals and who couldn't. Um, patient concerns over COVID were very high. Uh, there was a withdrawal of non-essential personnel from healthcare facilities. And then last but not least, the, the one thing I found very interesting that was the cl clinical trials that did progress pre-COVID, through COVID, past COVID, had data gaps or gaps where they were concerned about the continuity of the data they were collecting because of the adverse conditions during COVID. Now, if you look at this as a, a diagram of all of the clinical trials around the world, uh, we can see there were still 2,096 active clinical trials around the world, the majority of which were phase one and two. And you can see that even though in 2021 we did see a reduction, uh, it ranged all the way from only a 7% reduction back versus 2021 to 16% in tissue engineering and 16% in cell therapy, only 11% reduction in cell-based immunotherapies. So clinical trials still went on. There was uh, not that great of a reduction in the number that, that occurred. Many organizations, and there are only a few of them uh, named here, universities and companies, Stanford, Cellularity, Aloe Vera, and Harvard, uh, used their in-house technologies to put all hands on treating COVID. They had efforts of creating uh, CRISPR and AAV gene editing tools to um, edit the RNA of the COVID-19 virus. Others used uh, the generation of T cells from patients that had recovered from COVID to treat patients that were currently fighting the disease. There were many other approaches as well. The, the, the main point here is that many cell therapy companies pivoted and used their expertise to fight COVID and learned a lot in the process rather than going forward with their original uh, cell therapy plans. Investments, one of the things that I think is very interesting here in this field. Um, when you look at private equity and venture capital investments in cell and gene therapy in 2021, you can see that uh, in 2021, they were still quite high. This is billions of dollars. This has been growing exponentially. In fact, since 2010 to 2021, in 2010, there was only 362 million in, uh, invested in cell advanced therapies, I'll say. And that has increased to 68 billion by 2021. So you can see that there is great promise and there is great uh, investment in this space. That happens to be one third of all the private investment in life sciences. That's huge. 
for such a small industry, that's phenomenal. Uh, and it's brought life sciences as a whole only grew at a CAGR of 18%, and we can see gene therapy grew at 59%, and cell therapy at 63%. So we can see that we are a very small segment of the overall uh, ecosystem, uh, but we are very, very mighty. Um, if you look between 2021 and 2022, uh, investments in advanced therapies, uh, people had to tighten their belts. I mean, it was tight for everybody. Uh, many of the VCs were trying to protect their portfolio companies rather than going out and investing in new companies. Um, some people lost their funding, they missed their milestones because of COVID, and their funding was drawn, withdrawn. This, I, I know a number of people that this happened to. Um, and then people were afraid of what was going to happen with their government funding. You never know what's going to happen with that. Um, biopharma investments decreased by 32%, but you only saw a 15% decrease in investments in the advanced therapies. So you can see that this industry is run by CEOs and investors that understand that they have a long-term return on investment and they have to have patient capital. I think it's there. So um, we saw before COVID that cell gene or advanced therapies was basically on par with the rest of, of cell therapy when you look at the graphs and charts. There was a great disruption in the markets when COVID hit and they all followed a similar path. It's kind of like a swirl uh, in, in the markets. And it's thought that this is going to settle out, and especially in cell therapy, advanced therapies now post-COVID, once the economy settles down, once there's more certainty in the funding environment and the global stability, we're gonna see investments based more on um, science rather than hype. I think a lot of what we've seen in the past has been hype driving this. Uh, there's been a lot of VC investment with without a lot of knowledge about the science behind and the convergence of all the technologies that it takes to make this happen. I think we're gonna see smarter investment now, um, but as you'll see in the next slide, um, we have some, some great investments coming to us in the future. So uh, this was in 2021 to 2023. It's predicted that the advanced therapy market will grow to 30 billion in investment dollars by 2020, uh, 2030 at a CAGR of 21.72%. That's quite phenomenal. But that is an investment dollars. Uh, and then I bring this slide back again because we're just a small little part of the big world and uh, we're getting a lot of funding. Um, Post-COVID sales is expected to, to have very rapid growth from a small baseline. And the baseline is just this little, whoops, just this little blue uh, part here is what's represented by the cell and gene therapies. But we're expected to see uh, rapid growth in that small little slice. So what to expect in the new era? The new era, as individual companies straighten out their in-house funding, challenges, clinical trials, manufacturing, and financial concerns, we have to move the sector forward on a more global, universal, encompassing way. So we, we need better government support, and the FDA is attempting that with creating the Office of Therapeutic Products, which will result in reorganization of the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies and include six new offices. We also heard from ARPA-H, who has a very large interest in the advanced therapies. Um, we need better payer access. And you know they're very used to um, covering drugs that are given to a patient for a lifetime with a lifetime of illness. They're not used to one dose that costs half a million dollars 
with a healthy person for the rest of their life. It's a totally different pharmacoeconomic analysis and they need to get used to that and they also need long-term results on patient survival. And since this is such a young industry, that is often difficult to find. But they're in the transition and they're creating uh, creative models for funding advanced therapies that are on the market. More funding. We are seeing a decrease in the amount of funding for small molecules and traditional large molecules and a push towards the advanced therapies. And one very interesting fact is when COVID hit, 30 of the largest life science companies made billions and billions of dollars. They have dry powder. We also know that these companies have a number of pharmaceuticals that are going off patent, off the patent cliff. And they are, will be losing billions and billions of dollars unless they reinvest. And it is predicted that they will start investing very rapidly in what has become very popular as advanced therapies because of the promise of curing once incurable diseases. There will be enough capacity. We've all been concerned about uh, manufacturing capacity. And it's projected that capacity will grow from anywhere from 30 to 35% between now and 2026. Um, the concerns in the industry are more about allogeneic versus autologous. And so in case some of you don't know this or understand it, um, auto means self, so that means the cells are drawn from me, I'm really sick, right? And, and they draw cells from me and they genetically modify them or transform them and then expand them so there's enough cells to put back in me to treat my blood cancer. And that is one product that needs to be produced for each patient. That's really personalized medicine. That costs anywhere from $500,000 to, in some cases, $3 million per patient. So you can see why payers have a bit of a problem with that. And it also introduces a lot of variability in the manufacturing process because there's so many t steps and very little of it is automated to date or in closed systems. So to reduce the cost of goods sold for the biomanufacturing in the future, we need to start closing these systems, automating them as much as possible, and adding advanced IT to be able to track these types of data. Um, allogeneic, on the other hand, you can collect from a pool of donors and you can get viable cells that are immunoprotected or genetically modified to not be rejected by the recipient. And then you have a product you can freeze or store on the shelf and you have available as needed. The biomanufacturing process is a scale up very similar to a biosimilar or a, a, some of the monoclonal antibodies that you see. So that manufacturing model is much easier and less expensive. So moving towards allogeneic is going to be one of the step changes that we're hoping to see in the industry, but we believe there will always be some of both. But if you look at the cell types that are commonly used today, most of them are autologous rather than allogeneic. So we have a very large step change to go to get more allogeneic products uh, rather than autologous. And that big transition will require a new technology to either hide the cells from the host or genetically modify them so they are not rejected. Now I come back to CDMOs. There, as I said, there are, is going to be enough CDMOs, enough capacity in this industry because it's growing at 30 to 35%. And um, this slide was from Bioinformant 2022-2023. And globally, uh, these data indicate there was 191 uh, biomanufacturing facilities with 60 in the U.S. 
uh, 48 of those being CDMOs. I believe that number has increased since this slide and I'll be getting the new download as soon as she makes that ready. But when we look at the size of the market for biomanufacturing, it is huge. Um, in 2022, it was worth $2.2 billion. In 2027, it's predicted to be worth $5.1 billion. The leading therapies now, post-COVID, are going to be vaccine and infectious diseases followed by autologous, because we've had successes in commercialization on the market, um, followed thirdly by allogeneic. Oh wait, there was one more point here. So if we think about the capacity, the capacity is increasing. It's already, the market is already very large. Uh, we believe that we will be able to uh, have the capacity that's needed uh, to create the cells of the future. This is just a slide of some examples of some of the CDMOs. There's quite a few of them. And the, these are great big ones versus, um, for example, the Center for Breakthrough Mer uh, Medicine. This one is fairly new, sort of figuring out exactly where they can play right now. Uh, Organobio is not only a CDMO, it's also a product uh, producing company. It produces CGMP quality MSCs and other cell types that can be used for clinical trials. So the new era of science and technology, this is the most exciting part. This is where um, this year we could see as many as 13 new products commercialized here and in Europe. That's very exciting, very, very exciting. Um, the new combination therapies are on the horizon, where you use a combination of chemo, immunotherapy, and cell therapy and cell gene to start treating patients. This is very exciting. Um, advanced IPS, uh, IPS is advancing. It's, there's actually some in clinical trials now. The thing that holds them back is the fact that it's very manual and very intense to create iPS cells and get them in the state that you need them. So manufacturing has always been a setback for iPS cells. Um, new in vivo cell expansion protocols are being developed. Rather than doing them in a lab, they're putting them back in the patient, letting them do it. So it'll be exciting to see what happens there. Um, new potency assays need to be developed, and they are being developed as the industry grows and, and matures. Everybody understands we need to know what these cells are doing before we put them back in the patient. It's just getting some standards in place to do that. Um, <clears throat> new biomanufacturing technology to scale up and scale out. This is where I talked earlier about the closed systems, mechanization, and automation. 50% um, of the cost of goods sold in biomanufacturing is workforce. So although we want everyone to stay employed, we do need to decrease the costs of goods for biomanufacturing, especially these autologous products. We can do that uh, with closing the systems and then superimposing artificial intelligence on top of that with machine learning. And we can also tie the processes from arm, from arm to arm together with uh, an IT backbone, making this a continuous process where we can learn uh, and advance our technologies and uh, in, learn how to increase the quality of the product and make it available to patients at a lower price. Uh, new indications are being explored. Metabolic indications, diabetes, neurological, osteoarthritis, cancer tumors, and uh, uh, vaccine production, how vaccines can be used to, immu to immunize patients uh, against their sick cells or tumors, and then create T cells specific for those tumors, and then use cell gene to cure them. It's very exciting. So in summary, an individual, as individual companies resolve their independent concerns, um, the sector will require universal solutions, and those solutions are FDA approval, new FDA fast track 
pathways, standardization of potency assays and biomanufacturing, mechanization, closed systems, automation, IT, machine learning, um, and basically reducing the cost of goods sold so that payers will accept these and we can get them out to patients. This is really um, a greenfield industry and these are all of the things that really will help bring these cures to patients. Why do we do this? We do this because we want to cure patients. This is Emily Whitehead. She's 18 years old this year. And without the therapy that she received from Imrata, it would not have been possible. What I did realize here that this is a bloodborne disease and cancer, and bloodborne cancers have been the ones that have been uh, successfully treated using advanced therapy cell and gene. But when I started to look at the literature, I realized that was only 7% of all cancers in the world. So we have a long way to go. We've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. So for now, the advanced therapies are hard, but we will boldly go where no one has gone before to seek out new science for new cures. Thank you. So listen, uh, Jane Andrews, uh, Dr. Andrews, I've known for years, and she is one of the finest consultants in the field of regenerative medicine and commercialization. Uh, but one of the things that excited me, I didn't know if you were, were here to hear a keynote address from Dr. Amy Jenkins of this new federal agency called ARPA-H, which is really going to fund breakthroughs in the field, especially in the students in here, of, a, of the field that you're studying this summer, and, it, or, and it's going to emerge as the future of medicine, right? The cell therapy is the future of medicine. So I wonder if you would comment, Jane, on what ARPA-H represents to the field in general, and what do you think the potential is? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, ARPA-H is very much like DARPA was, and I don't know if uh, all of you are familiar with DARPA, but it had millions and millions of dollars to invest in new technology in a way that um, no, other, it, no other organization could invest in. So they were for creating new products that would actually be used to, to fill the stockpile um, of needed products in case of tragedy. That's what DARPA was originally founded on. Like you know, if there was radiation and everybody needed products to treat radiation or if there were medical products or blood banking, new techniques to bank blood, um, they would fund those kinds of things so they could fill stockpiles to keep people healthy in the United States. ARPA-H is more of a um, organization that has large, very deep pockets to create new technologies from a global perspective. So when we think about creating standard processes in regenerative medicine, we think about, I think about it like railroad tracks. We wouldn't have had a railroad if we didn't have investment in the track, right? So that's what ARPA-H can do for advanced therapies, is they can invest in the overall green field and advance the industry as a whole by funding specific parts of it that are very much needed to make it work long term. Any other questions? Hi, Dr. Andrews. I have a quick question just in regards to we we're talking about um, you know, COVID, pre-COVID, but did the pandemic reveal anything, any challenges or any sort of problems that now, pre-COVID, we wouldn't have realized, but now post-COVID are new roadblocks or to commercialization kind of, oh, well, we didn't think of that before, but now maybe something reveals itself now post-pandemic? Well, I think we have always had, I think one of the things that has been revealed is that we need better CRISPR technology. Um, and gene editing technology. 
uh, going forward to get less variability. We need that for whether it's vaccine production or it's a cell gene product. Um, I think that's one of the things that came out of COVID. That's the main thing I can think of per se. I, I, and I think that we also realize how long it takes to bring products normally to market and, you know, decades. And that, you know, some of the fast track techniques that FDA had to employ were cutting corners and sometimes you can say, well, that was good and that was bad because you, you don't have the number of clinical trials you need. But I think the FDA realized that, you know, they can't continue along the same vein they have if they're gonna bring these products to cure patients. So those are the two things I, I can think of right off the bat. Any other questions for Dr. Andrews? Okay, well thank you so much, wonderful presentation. Thank you.